I'm Derek from the Britannia Mine Museum, and I'd like to welcome you all to this amazing historic site. Behind me is this phenomenal Wabco truck, which greets our visitors as they drive by us on the Sea to Sky Highway. Take a look at the size of it. This machine hints at the scale of the work that took place on Britannia Mine. After exploration at the end of the 1800s, the mine operated from 1904 till 1974. During that period, it became one of the single largest producers of copper in the world. That element was used for many important purposes, but was especially important for creating the electric wiring that would allow the world to turn on the lights. If you were to measure the mine's whole output, imagine taking your thumb and your pointer finger, connecting the two, and picturing a copper wire of this thickness that could span the planet Earth eight times over. That's a lot of copper. So you needed some big machinery to get it going where it needed to be. can search for valuable minerals, just like people did in the gold rush of the 1800s. Personally, I think that the kids are better at this than I am. Have you found anything so far? Two gold. Two gold pieces? Three. Three? And four. Oh, that's awesome. Nothing like a day of treasure hunting to really uh, get you engaged. Gold? Yes. Pat there. Cool. Gold. That was my collection. I'll just keep looking for gold. Another one. <laughs> Maybe the most iconic part of our site is Historic Mill 3. It's been a National Historic Site since 1987 and played a critical role in the day-to-day -day operations of the mine. In its moment, this mill was one of the best copper concentrators in the world and was filled to the brim with amazing equipment. Britannia Mine's core sheds. These structures were filled with samples of the rock that were drilled out of the mine and could help the company to know which way to form their tunnels in order to find the most valuable veins of minerals. Every core could be sort of like a copper detector. That way, when they were forming the mine, they could not just be guessing which direction but targeting the places where they could make the most value. Mm -hmm. 
that's over a hundred years old. And just for both of your safety information, there's a couple precautions that I gotta go through with you. First off, I'll be hooking each of you up with a hard hat on the way in, and those do need to be worn for the duration. There's a little knob on the back that you can use to tighten them up. When we're inside, super important that we're listening, staying together, and being aware of our surroundings. There could be pool of water, tripping hazards, I don't know, there's no carpeting or Wi-Fi where we're going, so just use a bit of common sense, it'll be okay. <laughs> Includes copper. Come on a little closer. Look for the shiny golden sparkles. They're part of a compound called calcopyrite. The pyrite part gives them their gold color, but the other ingredient is copper. The fact that calcopyrite, not pure copper, was found in these tunnels is why we needed gigantic factories like the mill building because the copper had to be ground down and concentrated before it could be sold. The miners would use all kinds of equipment to do this job, as well as a vast array of drills that would fill the underground space with noise as they did the job of exploring these tunnels and eventually extracting calcopyrite-filled pieces of ore like this. Oh yeah, look at that. There's some pretty cool minerals hiding around this space. So far, we've explored the mine using some pretty modern museum lighting. But when the miners explored these tunnels, their world looked more like this. All of their work drilling the tunnel blasting through the rock, not to mention reading it and looking for signs of copper, had to be done by candlelight for the first couple of decades of the tunnel's history. It would be a whole lot trickier to spot any copper under these light conditions. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? There were a lot of different jobs on this mine, from drilling holes in the walls, to blasting the rock apart with dynamite, to operating complex drills to take the core samples that would help the miners to find their way. But if you're a newbie to the mining world, one of the first jobs that you might get could be what the miners call muck duty, where you would grab a shovel and start cleaning up some of that blasted out rock left behind by the other teams. company tradition would be the blowing of the compressed air-powered shift whistle. It would send a message to the other workers and everybody in the town site nearby that everybody had made it out of the shift safely. You might want to plug your ears because this whistle is loud. Three, two, one. <laughs> okay. So we now come to my favorite part of our tour, entering the mill building. 
this space is absolutely breathtaking and is one of my favorite spots to just absorb the feelings of the site. Not to mention, grab some photos for social media. Come on in, but watch your step. No building is very old. Cool. I think is a tremendous testament to the power of the industry and a reminder of just how much value was moving around in the 1920s. The mill was open for business uh, midway through 1923 and for years would have a reputation as a marvel of engineering and one of the best copper concentrators anywhere in the world. spaces that workers could use to monitor and communicate with one another. If there was an issue with equipment on one level of the mill building, it could be pretty tricky playing the game of telephone to send that message further along. The guy who is in that building might have to use noisy equipment, including sticks of dynamite, to send warning signals to other levels if attention was needed. Uh, so if you were to compare it to a typical building, mill three would be about 20 stories. Because the ceilings above us are so high, however, uh, there are 10 individual levels as well as the ground floor that we're standing on. That said, we have a lot of open space at the moment. It wasn't that way when the mill was operational. When the mine closed down, most of the equipment that could still be used at other mills around the world was auctioned off and emptied out. Meaning that although it's kind of a quiet, peaceful space now, when it was being used by the workers, the mill was really warm, really bright, and really noisy. So warm and bright, in fact, that natural lighting and uh, heating generated from the machinery was all that was ever planned in this building. I should mention to anyone who's thinking of coming for a visit, bring a jacket. <laughs> so I'm standing here in mill three. In this theatrical space, we run a very cool interactive special effects show called Boom! After Every Copper Quest Underground Tour. I love that this attraction is able to tell the story of this historic site from within the building itself. But I think it surprises a lot of people just how different the mill was and how much louder it could be compared to the quiet building that we know about today.
for the mines. Can you stand up? So it's pretty amazing that this place was started back in the 1800s and closed in 1974. Took 16 months to build that thing. Um, I guess the first one burnt down and so they rebuilt it. But wow, this is one amazing place. Some place, if you're in Vancouver area, Whistler area, Squamish, wherever you are, you have to check this place out. Um, the history here, is just amazing. Um, the guides, very knowledgeable, very accommodating, and a lot of work has gone into this. I remember when I was a kid, this building was trashed. Windows broken, spray paint, everything. Look at it now, it's amazing. And the workmanship that went in here to save everything, guys, you've done an amazing job. And uh, check it out, Britannia Mines in Squamish and you know guys this is what we do adventures and this is epic remember get out there and do epic shit thanks guys if you want more information www.vancityadventure.ca and go check out Britannia Mines that link will be below this is really cool and worth it see you guys later